music kept going on and on, and I was thinking, maybe they want me to do karaoke instead. <laughs> it's a really big mistake. You know what karaoke means, right? It's Japanese for torture. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you today. Thanks for coming to this. I want to talk to you about software quality um, or software quality in software houses, yes, or as I like to call it, squishy. But what this talk really is, is about quality, or to paraphrase Steve Ballmer, quality, 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 or as I refer to it, Q14. Someone pointed out there's actually 15 of these, so there's an error on this slide. We have a little bit of quality control in our slides office. We need to get on that. Hello, I'm Chet Haas, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. This is the agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about me. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Then I'm going to define what I mean by quality. And then I'm going to, again, tell you what I mean by quality. I'm going to produce an important equation because I think this is a technical talk, it's a technical conference, and therefore we need some Greek letters on the screen. I'm going to produce some data quality metrics. It's not quality unless you can measure it. Uh, and I also want to cover some common misconceptions, which I'm sure a lot of us have in the room, except for me. I also want to talk about what you can do to achieve quality in your organization, and then hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. So first, Let's talk about me. I am uh, the head of a company called Quality Consultants, Inc. I am the president and founder and COO, CTO, CEO, uh, and chairman. Uh, I also am a consultant and the sole employee. I have had many years in engineering, and this is the important bit, many years writing bugs. <laughs> but from 2015 until now, I have devoted my time to presenting on quality instead of writing code, and I have created zero bugs. We're going to get that back to that point later. Uh, I also, very importantly, have a certificate of quality that was issued in 2019, and I want to take a look at that now. Here it is. Um, there's a a couple of important things that I want to point out here. One is that um, quality is not only spelled correctly on the certificate, but it's actually pointed out twice. This is twice as important as a certificate that would only have one quality word on it. Uh, the other is that it is my certificate. And then finally, I want to point out, if you look closely in the upper right, that is high quality certificate. <laughs> All right. So how do we define quality? I like to define words by looking at their roots. Um, obviously, quality uh, comes from Latin roots. We have qual, which means what. We have it, obviously, understands for IT. And why, obviously, why. So if you put those all together, what? IT, why? Why, indeed. All right, let's see if we can figure that out then. All right, now what do I mean by quality? We can look at Latin all day. We don't really want to, but we could. But what do I mean by quality? Do I mean tests that you write? Should you be writing load tests to measure that quality? How about all of the myriad of other tests that you could write? Is this what I mean by quality? Actually, yes, it is. Right? I think tests are an important part of not only defining and measuring quality, but verifying that you actually have quality in your organization, in your product. What about quality metrics? What about charts and graphs? Here's one now. Now, this chart tells me that there are a number of defects that are going down over time, while the, number, the amount of quality on the product is going up over time. Is this what I mean? Obviously, yes. Right? If you don't have charts, then it's not a real business product. OK, what about eliminating bugs? Is that what I mean by quality? No. I want to share with you an important quote that I heard once, which is that quality software has no bugs to eliminate. If you find yourself eliminating bugs, then it wasn't a quality product to begin with. Um, this, of course, is a quote by me. <laughs> All right, so let me share with you an important uh, equation. This is the equivalence theorem of code, or Etsy. Starts out with a B for the number of bugs, and you can define this as the number of lines of code 
times the number of files in a project, times the number of statements, times the number of conditions, and then you need to square this term, because we usually do. And then we throw in a sigma for two reasons. One is that every important equation has a summation. The other is that uh, this is a Greek letter and makes it look far more important. Summations obviously always happen as x goes from 0 to infinity. I don't know why there's not an x in the equation, but it's always x. And then finally, we add in an epsilon term for the extra error term to cover any mistakes along the way. Now, why do we do that? Why do we add an epsilon? Because we're software engineers. And software engineering, to me, doesn't mean engineering. It means we make shit up, and then we work around it to get close enough to the real answer. And that's what epsilon does. All right, so this is the equation that you really need to focus on as your organization gets closer to quality. But let's talk about metrics. Let's talk about where these things live. Where do bugs live in the organization? Do they live in the documentation? How about the specification for the product or the memos and the emails that are produced and flying around the offices? How about people's desk drawers? Do those have bugs? They may, but not the bugs I'm talking about. How about the monitors, the conversations in the hallway, the meetings that you have with all the people on the team? Or what about just the code? That is where all the bugs lie. That's what we should be talking about right now. And who writes the bugs? Let's take a look at the organization again. Is it the salespeople? Is it the marketing people? Is it the administrative staff? What about the barista that's serving your coffee? How about the security guard? Are they writing bugs? What about the cleaners? What about management? Well, actually, yes. <laughs> this data comes from an organization that I consulted with where some of the managers used to be engineers and thought that they could still write code. And they did, and they submitted bugs. How about accounting? No. How about engineering? That is where the majority of the bugs come from, right? It's the engineers that are writing the bugs. All right, well, how do we compare the amount of code to the number of bugs? Well, we can take a look at charts and metrics, because uh, it's what we do in consulting. So we can see in this data from another consulting uh, gig that I had, the amount of code increased over time for the most part, and the number of bugs also increased over time. Now, I want to point out an anomaly in the data here where in the middle you can see that there's a dip in the amount of code, which strangely was related to a rise in the number of bugs, and then the situation reversed itself. Um, an engineer went into the code, mistakenly just deleted a lot of the code, uh, and that caused way more bugs than were there uh, to begin with. And then they realized what they'd done, and then management realized what they'd done, got rid of the engineer, and undeleted the code. And then we went back to the normal trend. But in general, as the amount of code goes up, the number of bugs goes up as well. Now, what we actually want, this is an ideal graph. So this is what you want. You want the number of bugs to go down over time. Uh, and that means the amount of code is going to go down over time. Now, how can you, in your organization, come up with a chart like this? There are three ways to do this. One, you can just run a charting program and make it. <laughs> That's what I did. Another is you can pay me to make that chart for you. Another, just to consider, is that you can actually fix your organization to produce this kind of data, and the chart produces itself. All right, so let me talk about some common misconceptions in software quality. I call this one believable solutions, or BS. So we have guidelines and ground rules and methodology excellence, which is called GAGME. Um, <laughs> we start out by identifying processes, uh, and then we document approaches that should be taken by the software team. We form teams to discuss appropriate methodologies on these teams. We present the findings to other teams in meetings across the organization. And then we have training with the entire overall team on all the guidelines that we've come up with and approved. And then finally, the engineers write the code. Now, if we look at what actually happens with software quality in all these processes, everything at the top does not produce bugs. But as soon as the engineers write code, they do. Right? That's where the bugs come from. All right, here's another one, common misconception, better specification, also confusingly called BS. First, we comprehensively itemize the requirements and we identify the problems. We propose the solutions, 
and then the engineers write the code. Once again, we find all the stuff at the top, no bugs. When the engineers write the code, that's when the problem started. How about the code review approval process, or CREP? <laughs> all right, there are actually two things going on here. This is the way that you think this works. So there's two engineers involved. Engineer A writes some code. Engineer B gets involved in the code review process, reviews the code, suggests some changes. Engineer A fixes those uh, problems and then submits the code, which is now obviously bug-free, right? OK, so engineer A writes code. That means that they produce bugs. Engineer B makes some reviews and suggestions. There's no code produced, so obviously no bugs are produced. Engineer A fixes the bugs. Obviously, there are no bugs produced because they're actually fixing bugs. And then the engineer submits bug-free code, no bugs. OK, that's the way you think it works. Here's what actually goes on. Engineer writes the code. There's bugs. There's reviews and suggestions. No code produced. No bugs created. Awesome. Engineer A writes some more code to fix the bugs, creating more bugs along the way, and then submits the buggy code. Again, you write the code, you create the bugs. That is how it works. All right, what about this process, product management supervision or PMS? So the product manager will identify features for the team to implement, then tells the engineer or the engineering team to implement these features, tracks the feature implementation, the engineers write the code, and what does that look like? So there's no bugs produced in identifying features. There's no bugs produced in doing all the project management of this stuff. Again, the engineer writes the code and creates the bugs. What about the famous work hours is never ending, right? Whiner. All right, so the engineer writes some code, produces some bugs. The engineer stays late. They realize there's bugs there, so they stay very late at the office and uh, write more code which means they create more bugs. And then they get tired, and unfortunately, they write more code, which ends up creating a lot of bugs. Uh, and then they sleep, and then there's no bugs created, right? So the sleep was actually the best quality part of this entire project. All right, so I think it's obvious to everybody, I hope, after all of this extensive analysis and total proof that I presented, that as you have more code, you have more bugs. Code leads to bugs, period. That's all there is to do about it. So what can you do about it? Let's look at some possible solutions. So fixing the problem, or FTP, which I don't really like as an acronym, so I call this HERO instead. All right, this is a typical software engineering organization. We can see some management structure. We can see some engineering teams laid up behind. Below them, they're all on workstations. They're connected through some intranet. There's a router that connects them to the internet. Um, they write some codes, they submit it uh, into the code base, and then it goes out onto the internet um, and gives their users all the bugs that they didn't want to begin with. Uh, so when we worked with this organization, we tried to eliminate the places that were causing the problem. So first of all, we eliminated the connection to the internet, which basically took out the internet for the company. Um, we thought this would do it. If they couldn't get their software out there, then they couldn't fix it. Turns out engineers are clever at getting software out to the internet. Uh, they just went to the Starbucks downstairs. Um, so we got rid of the router. We thought, well, at least if we can keep them from talking to each other. No, it didn't matter. Engineers don't talk to each other to begin with, right? Um, they still found ways to submit code and actually get it out to the users. Well, then we eliminated uh, the workstations. Well, if they can't actually write the code, then they can't do any of, uh, the, any of the problems that they were experiencing before. But it turns out they had several workstations and laptops at home, and they just found ways to keep creating the problems. Um, so then we took the next logical step. We eliminated the engineering organization. And then we had no bugs. It was a management only organization that we created, which turned out to be really effective in creating and shipping quality software. So this brings us to the next possible solution, which I call hire more managers, or hmm. All right, so there are some things that managers do, and there are some things that managers don't do. Managers do manage people. They manage their teams. They don't write code. They do attend meetings. They don't write code. They do speak with other managers. They don't write code. And they do facilitate cross-functional growth strategies and interdepartmental team facilitation for the purposes of collaborative interface and departmental-wide coordination. But they don't create bugs, right? OK, so this at this point, you're probably buying all this. I think this makes a lot of sense. But maybe in the back of your mind, you're thinking, wait, wait, wait. But if we're not creating software, well, we have products to sell. How do we actually 
make money? How do we get the product to the user if we're not actually writing the code that does that? Now, you did come to a talk on quality, not a talk on sales. But I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. What about the sales or was? All right, so this is a typical sort of time frame of a company that realizes the quality problem and wants to fix it. So they release 1.0, that goes out, they make some sales, people were pretty happy, but there's obviously bugs in there, so they release 1.1, it uh, goes out, uh, it's okay, there are bugs in there, plus features they want to implement, so they come out with 2.0, more bugs, so they have 2.1, then more bugs, there's 2.2. The larger the product gets, the more bugs there are, and the more bugs there are going to create just in fixing the bugs that are there to begin with. 2.2 comes out, 2.3 comes out, and this is where the thing happens that I like to call the corporate realization of company needs, or CROC, where they realize we're going to keep shipping software forever, and with that, we're just going to create and ship more bugs along the way. So at this point, they ship 2.3 again, but they call it 3.0. So they've created a product for their users. The users pay them for the product, but they have not injected any more bugs along the way. Right? Now, this didn't fix the bugs that were there, but at least they didn't introduce more. And then after that, they release 2.3 once more and call it 3.1. And now they're just on the treadmill. They can do this forever. Well, you're also probably thinking, since you're all actually engineers at this engineering conference, what about engineering? I saw that corporate graph that you showed that showed the elimination of all of the engineers in the organization. What does that, you're thinking, mean about me? Well, I'll be fine, but I'll tell you what it means about you. OK, so what about engineering or we? All right. So as you get involved in one of these organizations that is fixing the quality problems that you have with your code, you will do no more coding, which means there will be no more bugs, which means that there will be more quality, which means that you are developing expertise in quality, which means that you are now all experts in quality. And now, instead of doing engineering, you can give presentations on quality, like this one. <laughs> that is the solution. Now, uh, if there are questions, we do have some time for questions and answers, or as I like to call them, Q. Stunned, you all are. Just stunned. How can I possibly think of a question? I'm still processing all of the data. Yes. This is Joe White. When's the third version of the book that describes coming out? <laughs> uh, the third version, which uh, bears striking resemblance to the first version, uh, will be coming out as, first, as soon as the first two do. Yeah. yeah thanks. Hi. Wow. We got to work on the quality of mic distribution here. Uh, yeah. So, what uh, software did you use to create your wonderful charts? Sorry, what? Uh, which software did you use to create your wonderful charts? A very old version that has fewer bugs than the newer version of it. Yep. Thanks. Yes. Shout it out. I'll I'll see if I can get it. Uh, what does Android Q stand for? What does Android Q stand for? Oh. Uh, I, of course, am an independent consultant, and I have no impact upon companies that produce anything called Android Q, but I do have my own personal opinion on it that it should, in fact, stand for quinoa with sugar. <laughs> and not QAnon? Uh, not that, because I'm not even sure what that is. Nope. Anyone else? Everybody, you, have you solved your quality problems then? Are you all set? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, is my tie a clip-on? No, I do own a clip-on tie, but this is not the one. No, this one, I actually worked really hard on this knot. I hope you appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, let's take one more here. Anybody? From the vast number of people raising their hands, yes. How do I become awesome at making Android apps? Acronyms. <laughs> I blame you for getting the whole Android thing going here. I don't even know what Android is. Um, the trick with a good acronym is to think of the acronym that you want and then use a thesaurus to come up with the words that work. 
That is my personal algorithm for all of the acronyms that I use in life. Thank you very much. All right. How was that? Pretty good, huh? Awesome. Uh, well, I want to say a big thank you to the entire room, um, all of the attendees. We hope you come tomorrow. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, we think that uh, uh, this is a very, very important thing uh, we put on every year. It's lots and lots of work. We mentioned that about Michael. Um, we do have a, a pretty special thing we wanted, wanted to do really quick, um, Keith and I. Um, hey, everybody. So first off, I wanted to say that um, this is our fifth year here at Capital One um, hosting Android Summit. Um, it was really the brainchild of a Michael Jones, that guy over there in the corner. So um, as some of you know, um, I am actually an organizer of four different meetups in this area. I think that community is very, very important. Um, I was actually hired by Michael. I don't know why he allowed me to come in, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, but part of the kind of sales pitch was that we'd get to do really awesome things like this. Um, he's one of the most flexible engineers I've ever met, um, one of the best leaders I've ever met. Um, he came from a Microsoft world and basically uh, lobbied Keith <laughs> to let him run Android um, for our mobile platform. And uh, he's done a phenomenal job. So uh, from the bottom of my heart and the entire events team, I just want to say thank you very much, Michael, for all of your hard work. The, um, hey, everybody. My name is uh, Keith Forsyth, and uh, I run uh, web and mobile engineering here at Capital One for our uh, main servicing application. And, uh, and uh, Jared and several of the other organizers here uh, approached me about uh, recognizing uh, Michael in this uh, fifth year of this amazing, amazing event here. Um, and of course, uh, I was very excited about doing that. And, uh, and uh, I've had the, the privi privilege of working with Michael for, since I got to Capital One about five and a half years ago. And uh, I had a pretty funny uh, initial interaction with Michael. Um, when I first came in, um, uh, Michael built this like 20 page PowerPoint presentation uh, to explain to me why he should run Android for the company. And it was pretty cool because he was this huge Microsoft guy, of course, and had this reputation at the company for being Microsoft. And I think at one point you dragged me to the Xamarin office even before Microsoft <laughs> Microsoft had uh, had uh, uh, purchased them up. But um, um, uh, very passionate about Android. Uh, really, really love the ecosystem, and really passionate about the developer experience. And so. Uh, this, uh, you know, we encourage Michael to do this event. He, he really was excited about doing it, and it has grown to this many folks over these past several years and made a bunch of great friends with this and, uh, and uh, done a lot of great work for the community. So I wanted to just thank Michael. I think, Toria, do you have, a, do you have something? All right, why don't you bring that out? Come on, come on up, Michael. Come on, Michael. <laughs> Let's give a big hand to Michael Jones. <laughs> Come on up, Michael. <laughs> you didn't know any of this was coming, huh? <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, um, let me uh, let me just. I believe does is the inscription in there? It's in there. Okay. There okay. Great. So we have a little award for you, a little something, something for your desk, presented to Michael Jones in recognition of your vision, leadership, and dedication to the annual Android Summit celebrating five years. Congratulations. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to hold it together very long, so I'll just say thank you. I think I've said that a hundred times over the last couple of days, and I couldn't mean it more um, to all of you, to all the speakers, and especially to the event team. This is not a one-person show, and I cannot stress that enough. There might be one person holding this thing, but it's an entire team of people that stand behind it. And every time I look at it, that's what I'm going to think about. 
So thank you very much. I appreciate it very much. And thank you. And the Um, last item, um, we uh, are going to adjourn up the stairs to the Maplewood Hall room, which is right there on the seventh floor. Um, we ought to have some escorts going up uh, with you, and then we'll have the reception and um, uh, drinks and food and all that good stuff. So thank you very much and appreciate you coming and looking forward to see you all tomorrow and at the reception. Thank you. Thank you.